Palm Sunday. What happened on Palm Sunday and how it was foretold and the importance of Palm Sunday. The title of the message is Thy Coming King. Turn with me to Luke chapter 19, verse 28. It's the end of Jesus' ministry, the last week on earth. He spent three and a half years ministering with his disciples, telling them this day was going to come. They had wanted Jesus to go to Jerusalem and to set up his kingdom, but he said, my time has not yet come. Well, now his time had come. Luke chapter 19, verse 28 It says, when he had said this, he went on ahead, going to Jerusalem, going up to Jerusalem. And it came to pass, when he drew near to Bethpage and Bethany, at the mountain called Olivet, that he sent two of his disciples, saying, go into the village opposite you, where, as you enter, you will find a colt tied on which no one has ever sat. Loose it and bring it here. And if anyone asks you, why are you loosing it? Thus you shall say, shall say to him, because the Lord has need of it. So those who were sent went their way and found it, just as he had said to them. But as they were loosing the colt, the owner of it said to them, Why are you loosing the colt? And they said, The Lord has need of him. And they brought him to Jesus. And they threw, on, and they threw their own clothes on the colt, and they set Jesus on him. And as he went, many spread their clothes on the road. Then, as he was now drawing near the descent of the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works they had seen, saying, Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. They were quoting Psalm 118 there. It's a messianic psalm. The ancient rabbis believed that that was a psalm of the Messiah. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. And some of the Pharisees called to him from the crowd, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. But he answered and said to them, I tell you that if these should keep silent, these stones would immediately cry out. Pastor John gave me one of the stones from Jerusalem that didn't cry out. I appreciate that. (laughs) Now as he drew near, he saw the city and wept over it, saying, If you had known, even you, especially in this your day, the things that make for your peace, but now they are hidden from your eyes. For days will come upon you when your enemies will build an embankment around you and surround you and close you in on every side and level you and your children within you to the ground. And they will not leave in you one stone upon another because you did not know the time of your visitation. This story is the fulfillment of thousands of years of anticipation by the Jews awaiting their coming king. The Messiah, the Mashiach, the anointed one, who had been foretold throughout the Old Testament, this anointed king that would come to the people, ultimately to restore the kingdom of God on earth. And we need to remember that the Bible, in 2 Timothy 3.16, says that all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, and for instruction in righteousness. All scripture is inspired by God. One of the most powerful proofs, indeed the proof that convinced me that the Bible was indeed the word of God, is God's ability to declare the end from the beginning. In Isaiah chapter 46, verse 9 and 10, God said through the prophet Isaiah, Remember the former things of old, for I am God and there is no other. I am God and there is none like me, declaring the end from the beginning. And from ancient times, things that are not yet done, saying, my counsel shall stand, and I will do all my pleasure. Here God says, 
that the thing that is the proof that he is God is not his miracles, not his power, it's not his love for the nation of Israel. The thing that he leans upon, the thing he points out that is the proof of his deity is his ability to declare the end from the beginning. There is none like me declaring the end from the beginning. And this event we read about here in Luke 19 was indeed foretold. It was foretold by God through the prophets, as we'll see. And Jesus held them accountable. He said that the city of Jerusalem was going to be destroyed. He knew he was going to go into Jerusalem. He would be despised and rejected and killed. And the rabbis who were complaining that the people were quoting the psalm, that messianic Psalm 118, which was a a declaration of the Messiah, they rebuked his disciples. Jesus held them accountable for knowing that he was supposed to be there at that time. And their city would be destroyed. Jerusalem would be destroyed. There would be not one stone left upon another. Why? Because you did not know the time of your visitation. He held them accountable. He held them accountable because the prophets foretold the manner in which the Messiah would come. And he held them accountable because the prophets had even foretold the very time that the Messiah would come. And he held them accountable because he told told the disciples that it would be so. He held them accountable. God declares the end from the beginning. Over 300 prophecies in the Old Testament were fulfilled in Jesus' first coming. And one of the prophecies was in Zechariah 9.9. It says, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. He is just and having salvation, lowly and riding on a donkey, colt, the foal of a donkey. It was foretold hundreds of years before Jesus was even born that that when the Messiah came, that it would indeed be on a donkey. Now, some Jews today will tell you, some Orthodox Jews that don't believe in Messiah say that's ridiculous. The Messiah is not going to come on a donkey. And yet, when you look at the writings of the ancient Jews, the ancient rabbis that compiled their writings between the year, between about 200 BC up to about 500 AD, the writings and commentaries of ancient rabbis were compiled in a document called the Babylonian Talmud. And in the Talmud, in the tract Sanhedrin 98a, they spoke about this very verse. The rabbi in Talmud Sanhedrin 98a said that if Israel behaved worthily, the Messiah would come in the clouds of heaven, if otherwise humble, riding on a donkey. What an interesting interpretation. Now, we don't exactly know when this was written, but the Talmud indeed is a compilation of writings from about 200 B.C., as I said, up to about 500 A.D. If if Israel behaves worthily, the Messiah will come in the clouds. If not, he'll come humble, riding on a donkey. Interesting. The Bible indicates in detail in the Old Testament the very time that the Messiah was to come. Let's look just a little bit about what we know about the Bible in terms of when it was written and what the archaeological evidence tells us about the accuracy of the Bible. The Old Testament was penned roughly between about 4,000 B.C., the book of Job is believed to be the oldest book of the Bible, and the book of uh, Malachi, the the Italian guy, about 400 uh, B.C., We actually have manuscripts of the Old Testament in existence that are around 700 to 800 B.C. There are portions of Genesis, Exodus, and several of the other books that are back as far as about 700 to 800 B.C. We actually have fragments of the Old Testament that are that old. The Hebrew Old Testament was translated from Hebrew into Greek by 72 Hebrew scholars beginning in around 285 B.C. in Alexandria, Egypt. This document is called the Septuagint. And so the entire Old Testament was written in Greek 284 years, 285 years before Christ was even born, including all of the prophecies that he would fulfill. So we had it in Greek 
and in Hebrew by 285 B.C. Now, in our time, the Dead Sea Scrolls were discovered in 1947 by a Bedouin shepherd boy who was looking for his, his lost goat in the Dead Sea area. The significance of the Dead Sea Scrolls is absolutely staggering. They found thousands of biblical texts, everything from entire copies of books of the Bible to small fragments of the Bible written on parchments. The Dead Sea Scrolls, it is believed, were penned between somewhere around 200 B.C. and 70 A.D. The Dead Sea Scrolls consists of biblical texts, copies of Old Testament manuscripts, as well as commentaries on Jewish law, Jewish customs, as well as historical events that went on in Judea. And when they've examined over the last 50 plus years the biblical texts, again, these were put in the ground. They were, the Dead Sea Scrolls were uh, copies of biblical manuscripts that were written by the Essenes, a very devout group of Jews, that put these documents in clay jars and sealed them with pitch and tarps and put them in the ground around 70 AD, scholars believe, because the Romans were sacking Jerusalem and they were destroying Israel. And so they wanted to protect these very important documents. And they sat in those caves for almost 2,000 years until 1947. Well, when they found them and they begin to examine these texts over the last 50 years, it's shown that the Old Testament indeed has been preserved with near perfect accuracy. When the King James Version Bible was uh, translated in uh, the 1600s, the manuscripts that the King James translators had of the Old Testament were from about 900 to 1,000 years A.D. They didn't have very many really, they didn't have ancient manuscripts to rely upon. And when the Dead Sea Scrolls were found, we now had copies, even entire copies of manuscripts like the book of Isaiah that were from around 200 B.C. And so we were able to look at manuscripts of the ancient Hebrew text that were much, much, much older than what was in existence at the time when the King James Bible was created. And as they've examined these texts, they've shown that the Bible, the Hebrew text of the Old Testament, was, re, was re, uh, preserved with impeccable accuracy. The differences are so insignificant. They're stylistic differences, such as differences in spelling and obvious slips of the pen. And scholars admit that there's not a single portion of Scripture that, or single doctrine that is altered or changed in any way by the differences that extremely minor differences between the Dead Sea Scrolls and the manuscripts that were existent, in existence in the 900s. This is a photograph of one of the Dead Sea caves. This is a photograph of the uh, portion of the complete book of Psalms that was found in the Dead Sea Scrolls. And so the importance of the Dead Sea Scrolls was that it showed that the Bible had been preserved for thousands of years. The Old Testament had been preserved for thousands of years, virtually unchanged. And as we mentioned, the Old Testament had been translated from Hebrew to Greek by about 285 B.C. When I was a non-believer, a uh, third-year medical student at UC San Diego School of Medicine, I bought this little uh, cheat sheet, uh, this little uh, book of internal medicine notes that all the medical students would buy. And at the very back page, the last two pages of this internal medicine text, this guy that made this book, which is a very helpful book, he had this prophecy in there from the Bible called Daniel's 70 Weeks Prophecy. And I read that thing, and it bugged me. <laughs> it bugged me, because this prophecy, according to this guy, foretold the very day that the Messiah came, and he pointed out that Jesus actually fulfilled the prophecy. And I was an atheist. I was an evolutionist. I believed that I was the product of a lightning bolt striking a puddle three billion years ago. <laughs> and so several years went by. I finished my residency and was early in my practice, and I was determined to prove that prophecy wrong. So I bought the complete works of the Encyclopedia Britannica, 
Don't tell my wife that was the reason I wanted to do it. Because I was going to look up these historical figures and I was going to prove Daniel's 70-week prophecy was wrong. That was my goal. So I spent like, you know, $1,600 on the encyclopedia to try to prove this wrong. And now look what I'm doing. So obviously I failed miserably. <laughs> Let's talk about Daniel. Daniel was a young boy when he was taken captive by the Babylonian army in around 606 BC during the first siege of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon. Nebuchadnezzar then laid siege to Jerusalem two more times, finally destroying Jerusalem and the temple in 587 BC. I remember reading this story in in the book of Daniel when I was a non-believer and thinking, ah, these names are all made up, you know, who knows if any of these guys ever existed. Well, a couple of months into my Christian experience, I was studying the Bible and I was being blown away by the things I learned, especially in Daniel. And my wife and I uh, one day went to a mall that had a, a coin shop. And I was looking at all these coins, all these old coins, and I come up to this ancient coin section, and I look in there, and it says, here's a coin of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon. I went, whoa, the dude was real. (laughs) They made a coin with his face on it. Justin Alfred told me that this is, um, this indeed says uh, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon on the back. I'll take Justin's word for it. And it was really strange. Here I am, a a brand new Christian, you know, kind of still having problems with doubt, et cetera, and and kind of wondering, you know, what are all these old names of these people in the Bible? And and I saw this coin, and I had like a spiritual experience in the coin shop. I'm just sitting there going, whoa, this dude was real. You know, it was like, you know, I'm a skeptic. You know, I'm sort of like Thomas. Unless I see the coin with his face, I will not believe, you know, (laughs) that kind of a thing. And I saw the coin. It was there. There was his face. I couldn't believe it. Nebuchadnezzar was a real guy. Just blew me away. Well, Daniel was taken captive. And Daniel, young, faithful man, basically spent 70 years in Babylon. And around the end of that 70-year period, around 537 B.C., Daniel was studying and praying And he was given a prophecy by an angel regarding the people and the nation of Israel. Turn with me to Daniel chapter 9, verse 24. Daniel was praying and confessing his sins and confessing the sins of the nation. Daniel knew from the prophet Jeremiah that the nation of Israel was going to be in captivity 70 years. God had told the prophets that they would be in captivity for 70 years. Daniel had done his math. He knew it was about up. And he began praying for the people and praying what God might have him do. Daniel chapter 9 The angel Gabriel visits him. I'm going to go back to verse 21. Actually, let's go to verse 20. Now, while I was speaking and praying and confessing my sin and the sin of my people Israel and presenting my supplication before the Lord, my God, for the holy mountain of my God, yes, while I was speaking in prayer, the man Gabriel, whom I had seen in the vision at the beginning, being caused to fly swiftly, reached me about the time of the evening offering. He informed me and talked with me and said, O Daniel, I have now come forth to give you skill and to understand. At the beginning of your supplications, the command went out, and I have come to tell you, for you are greatly beloved. Therefore, consider the matter and understand the vision. The angel didn't say, you know, just be numb and confused. No, consider it and understand. And the angel says, 70 weeks are determined for your people and for your holy city. The word weeks there is a Hebrew word, shabuam, which literally means a week of years or a seven-year period. So this is a prophecy about the people in the nation of Israel. Seventy weeks, seventy shabuam are determined for your people and for your holy city. To finish the transgression, to make an end of sins, to make reconciliation for iniquity, and to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up vision and prophecy 
and to anoint the most holy. Know therefore and understand. Boy, twice now he's told him, understand, Daniel, get this. Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the command to restore and build Jerusalem until Messiah the Prince, the Mashiach Nagid, there shall be seven weeks, seven Shabuam, and 62 weeks. The street shall be built again and the wall even in troublesome times. And after the 62 weeks, Messiah shall be cut off, but not for himself. And the people of the prince who is to come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. The end of it shall be with a flood until the end of the war desolations are determined. Then he shall confirm a covenant with the many for one week. But in the middle of the week, he shall bring it to an end, sacrifice an offering. And on the, war, and on the wing of abomination shall be one who makes desolate even until the consummation which is determined is poured out on the desolate. We're going to focus here on the first couple of verses here. Daniel chapter 9, verse 24 and 25 and part of 26. This is a mathematical prophecy regarding the time of the coming of the Messiah. And that's what bugged me. Here I was an atheist, evolutionist, third-year med student who read this thing and it just bugged me. It looked like Jesus was the Messiah and I hated that idea. This was a mathematical prophecy and Daniel was told more than once, know and understand, consider the vision, understand this. That 70 weeks are determined for your people and for your holy city. Know therefore and understand, verse 25, that from the going forth of the command to restore and rebuild Jerusalem until Messiah the Prince, there shall be seven weeks and 62 weeks. Now, again, this word week is the Hebrew word shabuam. Daniel is told that 69 shabuam, 69 weeks of years after the command goes forth to rebuild the city of Jerusalem and the sanctuary that the Messiah would come. Now, Daniel here in around 537 B.C., knew that the city of Jerusalem had been laid waste back in about 587. The city had been destroyed. He knew that the temple was destroyed, completely destroyed, by Nebuchadnezzar's army. And he'd been waiting these 70 years, and now he's given this commandment that 69 weeks of years, 69 seven years, seven-year periods, after the command goes forth to restore and rebuild Jerusalem, the Messiah would come. It's a mathematical prophecy. Again, a shaboom is a week of years, much like the word decade means a 10-year period. 69 seven-year periods would be 483 years. A biblical year was 360 days. Robert Anderson is credited in his book, The Coming Prince, for demonstrating that fact, that the Jews used a 360-year calendar for biblical prophecy. So 483 years times 360 days per year is 173,880 days. The angel is essentially saying that 483 years after the command goes forth to restore and rebuild the city of Jerusalem, the Messiah, the Mashiach Nagid, this anointed one, is going to come. Now, when did this particular command occur? It didn't occur during Daniel's time period. It occurred several decades later. And it's recorded in the book of Nehemiah, Nehemiah chapter 2, verse 1 and 2. Nehemiah was the king's cupbearer, a Jew who was faithful to the king of the Medo-Persian emperor, Artaxerxes Langemanus. Nehemiah here in Nehemiah 2 writes in verse 1, and it came to pass in the month of Nisan, in the 20th year of the reign of Artaxerxes, when wine was before him, I took wine and gave it to the king. Now I had never been sad in his presence before. Therefore the king said to me, Why is your face sad since you are not sick? And Nehemiah goes on to say that he's sad because the city of his people and the sanctuary were still destroyed and desolate. And he asked Artaxerxes, Langemanus, king of the Medo-Persian Empire, to give him permission and give him letters, in effect, papers of passage, to allow him to go back to Jerusalem to rebuild his city 
in the sanctuary. And right there on the spot, you read Nehemiah, he was given permission. He was given letters. And Nehemiah went to Jerusalem. Well, that command, we're told, occurred in the 20th, in the month of Nisan, in the 20th year of the reign of Artaxerxes Longimanus. Now remember, the first time I saw this, I was an atheist. And so I got that Encyclopedia Britannica. I told my wife, I think we need to get this for the children. <laughs> I was going to, there was no internet back then, and I was going to disprove this prophecy. So I go to my Encyclopedia Britannica, and it has Artaxerxes Longimanus in there, and it says that he ascended to the throne of the Medo-Persian Empire in July of 465 B.C. Now the 20th year of his reign would have been 446 B.C. We're told that the decree occurred in the month of Nisan. And according to Hebrew tradition, when the day of the month is not specifically stated, it is given to be the first day of the month. So the decree to Nehemiah occurred on the first day of the Hebrew month Nisan in 445 B.C. According to calculations done by the Royal British Observatory, that day corresponds to the 14th day of March, 445 B.C. It's confirmed by the British Royal, Observato British, British Royal Observatory and published by Sir Robert Anderson in his book, The Coming Prince. So, that date, March 14th, 445 B.C., if we count forward 173,880 days from March 14th, 445, 445 B.C., and folks, I did this math. <laughs> Papers and papers of calculations. We arrive at April 6th, 32 AD. I was really bothered by that date. <laughs> a couple of caveats. When you do this math, and if you're a skeptic, I'd recommend you do it. There is no year, year zero in the Christian calendar. You go from 1 BC to 1 AD. And leap years do not occur in centuries, years like 1100, 1200, you know, BC, etc., 600, 400, 500. Century, uh, leap years do not occur in century years which are divisible by, by four. That's why four years ago in the year 2000 there was no leap year. And so when you do the math and you take into consideration all of the leap years and all these factors, you get to April 6th, 32 AD. Well, let's look at the New Testament. See what the New Testament says about this date. In Luke chapter 3, verse 1, it gives us a, a description of who was reigning during the time of John the Baptist's ministry and when Jesus was um, baptized. Luke chapter 3, starting at verse 1, says, Now in the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, Pontius Pilate being governor of Judea, Herod being tetrarch of Galilee, his brother Philip, tetrarch of Aturia, and the region of Trachonitis, and Lysanias, tetrarch of Abilene, while Annas and Caiaphas were high priests, the word of God came to John, the son of Zacharias, in the wilderness. And he went into the region, and he went into all the region around the Jordan, preaching a baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. You go down to verse 21 and points out that. Jesus was baptized at that same time. It says, when all the people were baptized, it came to pass that Jesus was also baptized. And while he prayed, the heaven was open and the Holy Spirit descended in bodily form like a dove upon him. And a voice came from heaven, which said, you are my beloved son, in you I am well pleased. So the baptism of Jesus Christ occurred, according to this prophecy, in the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar. Now, Again, being a skeptic, I went to my Encyclopedia Britannica and I looked up Tiberius Caesar and I found out that the Romans kept very, very, very good records on chronology. Tiberius Caesar began his reign on the 19th of August in the year 14 AD. Jesus was baptized and began his ministry in the fall of the 15th year of the reign of Caesar Tiberius, which would come to about 28 AD. The ministry of Jesus was three and a half years years long. And so the first Passover of Jesus' ministry would have been in the spring of 29 AD. The fourth Passover of his, of his ministry would have been in the year 
32 AD. Whoops. Huh. Darn, I said to myself. Encyclopedia Britannica is confirming this. Passover that year fell on April 10th, and the Sunday before was April 6th, 32 AD, the very day that Jesus presented himself to the crowd, 173,880 days after the decree of Artaxerxes Longimanus, when the crowd said, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, the Psalm of the Messiah. Wow. Now, if you're a Christian scholar, you notice that there's a disagreement amongst Christians whether this occurred in the year 32 or the year 33. That bothered me. So I bought a half a dozen books on biblical chronology. Man, were they boring. And I read them and I read them and I read them and I read all these arguments and these guys fighting with each other and arguing with each other. And basically, the disagreement between these two years, 32 versus 33 AD, comes down to the fact that scholars disagree on when the first year of a king's reign begins. Some scholars argue that it begins the first day of office. Others believe it begins on the first anniversary. But it turns out that whether you do the math either way, if we begin the calculations of this prophecy on the first anniversary of Artaxerxes' um, reign and Tiberius Caesar's reign, we still end up with, three, it ends up 360 days later, which would be April 33 AD. So the intellectual debate about where do you start counting is only off by exactly 360 degrees. So it was either 32 or 33 AD. You know, it's like, does it really matter? No. Because the bottom line with this prophecy is the Messiah had to come before the second temple was destroyed. And the second temple was destroyed in 70 AD. It says in verse 26 of Daniel chapter 9, and after the 62 weeks, you have the, the seven and then the 62 weeks, the Messiah will be cut off. The word there, cut off, means is the word cut off in Hebrew, and it means to be killed for a capital crime. So here it says the Messiah is going to come 69 weeks of years after the command goes forth to restore and rebuild Jerusalem. And then once he comes, he's going to be killed. And then it says, after the 62 weeks, the Messiah shall be cut off, but not for himself, meaning not because of something evil that he did. And the people of the prince who is to come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. So after the Messiah comes, 173,880 days after the command goes forth from Artaxerxes, he's going to come, he's going to be killed, and then they're going to destroy the city and the temple again. Well, what did Jesus say? The city and the temple are going to be destroyed again, and not one stone will be left upon another. So we know that this prophecy demands that the Messiah must come before the destruction of the second temple. What did the ancient rabbis think about Daniel chapter 9? Very interesting. Very interesting when you look into what the ancient rabbis believed. Here's a guy. How about this for a name? Rabbi Moses Abraham Levi. Do you think that guy's Jewish or what? <laughs> he said, I have examined and searched all the holy scriptures and have not found the time for the coming of the Messiah clearly fixed except in the words of Gabriel to the prophet Daniel, which are written in the ninth chapter of the prophecy of Daniel. This rabbi is from the Middle Ages. I think he's from about the 14th century. And he basically says that the time of the coming Messiah was written about by Daniel in his ninth chapter. The Babylonian Talmud speculates a lot about the time of the coming of the Messiah. Remember, the Babylonian Talmud was compiled and completed around the 5th century AD. So five centuries after Christ was born, the Babylonian Talmud was finally compiled. And it consists of commentaries by prominent rabbis. And in the Babylonian Talmud... In tract Sanhedrin 98b, speaking about the time of the coming of the Messiah and Daniel's 70 weeks, this rabbi said these times were over long ago. The Jews, during the time of the compiling of the Babylonian Talmud, recognized the time of the coming of the Messiah was overdue. They believed the Messiah missed his appointment with Israel. Rabbi Maimonides, who lived in the 12th century, said, Daniel has elucidated to us the knowledge of the end times. However, since they are secret, 
the wise, meaning the wise rabbis, have barred the calculation of the days of Messiah's coming so that the untutored populace will not be led astray when they see that the end times have already come, but there's no sign of the Messiah. The Orthodox Jews of the 12th century believed the Messiah missed his appointment with Israel. Jesus held them accountable. With regards to the ministry of the Messiah, the Old Testament has two veins of prophecy. There was the ruling and reigning vein of prophecy woven throughout the biblical text which spoke about the Messiah who would come on the scene, who would rule and reign on the throne of David forever and ever. But there was also that suffering servant vein of prophecy so beautifully described in Isaiah chapter 53 speaking about the fact that the Messiah would be despised and rejected that he would be beaten, that he would give his back to the smiters, according to Isaiah chapter 50, that he would be despised and rejected, that he would even be killed, and that he would pour out his soul unto death, and that his death would make intercession for the transgressors. Isaiah chapter 53, written seven centuries before Christ was born. But the ancient expectations of the Jews during the time of Christ had become unbiblical. They had been under the thumb of the Babylonian Empire, the Medo-Persian Empire, the Grecian Empire, and now the Roman Empire. The Jews had been oppressed and afflicted for hundreds of years. And they looked, they yearned for the Messiah to come and to fulfill the ruling and reigning vein of prophecy. And so they allegorized the suffering servant vein of prophecy. They came to believe that, well, the Messiah wouldn't really die when he came. He would come and he would be you know, rejected by some people and he would suffer some, but he, he wouldn't actually die. He wouldn't actually be cut off from the land of the living because when the Messiah comes, they believed, he's going to set up the kingdom of Israel on earth. That's why the disciples said, Lord, will you now set up your kingdom? No, my time has not yet come, Jesus said. I met a modern Orthodox Jew a month or so ago at a Barnes and Noble. I saw this guy reading uh, books from the back forward. (laughs) I thought, hmm, it's got to be Hebrew. So I kind of walked by him faking like I'm looking at a magazine and I saw Hebrew. Oh yeah, it's Hebrew. So I kind of hung around and just kept hanging around and hanging around. And eventually um, he started talking to me and I was talking to him, just small talk. And I said, I noticed you're reading Hebrew there. He goes, yeah. I said, are you an Orthodox Jew? He goes, yeah, I'm I'm a Hasidic Jew one of the Hasidim. I said, really? I said, um, I said, do you believe about the Messiah that there's two veins of prophecy? That one vein says he's going to rule and reign on the throne of David forever? And yet there's another vein of prophecy which speaks about the fact that the Messiah would be rejected and despised and suffer and that he would die? He says, yes, we believe in, in both of those veins of prophecy. And I said, well, how do you explain that then? I said, what do you do with these these suffering servant vein of prophecies and he kind of, he must have known where I was coming from I guess he could tell and he wouldn't answer the question really until I finally pressed him I said look these prophecies that speak about the Messiah being cut off from the land of the living he poured out his soul unto death I said are this was this an actual death or was it an allegorical death he says allegorical I said so you don't believe when the Messiah comes he's actually going to be despised rejected suffer and die no we believe that it's a spiritual death but that he'll, in effect, be resurrected to greatness and be accepted by Israel as the Messiah. He denied the actual death of the Messiah. He spiritualized it. He allegorized it exactly, I believe, as the ancient Jews did. The Bible is, the Old Testament's quite clear about the coming of the Messiah. Zechariah 9.9 said that the Messiah was going to come humble riding on a donkey. But the book of Daniel said, in Daniel chapter 7, verse 13, that the Messiah was going to come with the clouds of heaven. That he was going to come in the clouds of heaven and set up the kingdom of God. And it is this coming that the Jews were looking for, and that's what they're looking for today. Daniel chapter 7, verse 13 and 14. Daniel says, I was watching in the night visions, and behold, one like the Son of Man coming with the clouds of heaven... He came to the Ancient of Days, and they brought him near before him. 
Then to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away and his kingdom the one which shall not be destroyed. This explains why back in the Babylonian Talmud I showed you before, the rabbis said if Israel behaves worthily, the Messiah would come in the clouds of heaven, but if otherwise, he would come on a donkey. And so when you look at the writings of the rabbis during the time after Christ, when they realized that the time of the Messiah had passed, when they look at the writings, they say the reason that the Messiah has missed his appointment is with Israel is because of the sin of the nation of Israel. They believe the Messiah missed his appointment. But the fact is, it was two comings. Now, Daniel chapter 7, verse 14, says that we will be given a kingdom which is an everlasting dominion. In the Hebrew, I looked it up, it literally means an empire that will last forever. The Jews of Jesus' time were looking for the Messiah to come in the clouds of heaven to set up the kingdom, even though Jesus warned them that he, when he, that he came to be crucified and to give his life as a ransom for many. Matthew chapter 20, verse 27 and 28, Jesus said, And whoever desires to be the first among you, let him be your slave, just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. He came to give, give up his life as a ransom. Matthew chapter 26, verse 1 and 2, Jesus said, now it says, Now it came to pass when Jesus had finished all these sayings that he said to his disciples, You know that after two days is the Passover and the Son of Man will be delivered up to be crucified. He told them the Son of Man is going to go to Jerusalem and he's going to be killed. He told them he came to be a ransom for many. So the question is, by which method is the Messiah going to come first? The Messiah on a donkey or the Messiah in the clouds of heaven? The way the ancient rabbis dealt with this issue, for hundreds of years, rabbis debated with this. They came up with a two Messiah theory. The idea that there was two Messiahs. One Messiah called Messiah ben Joseph, who would be a suffering servant Messiah. And another Messiah called Messiah ben David, who would be a separate person who would come and rule and reign. The ruling and reigning vein of Messiah. So I said to this guy at the bookstore, I said, do you believe in the two Messiah theory? He goes, nah. He goes, that's rubbish. Because all of the prophecies that speak about the Messiah in the Old Testament are uh, singular pronouns. One will be born. One shall come, etc. And so I said, you believe in one Messiah that's got to fulfill two veins of prophecy. And I said, if... It turns out that that vein of prophecy, the suffering servant vein of prophecy, is an actual rejection, suffering, and death. I said, which vein of prophecy would f have to be fulfilled first? Considering the fact that the uh, ruling and reigning vein of prophecy is an unbroken reign. He said, well, I suppose he'd have to come first and be despised, rejected, and be killed, and then come a second time to rule on the throne of David forever and ever. And I said, yeah. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> but we don't believe that it's an actual death. We believe that it was just sort of, you know, he was so frustrated that he felt like he died inside. Well, okay, whatever. Reign or die, which comes first? Logically, obviously, if it is not an allegorical death, if it's an actual death, and if he must come both on a donkey humbly to suffer and be rejected and die, and yet come another time to rule and reign on an unbroken reign, sitting on an, taking up an everlasting kingdom. He must come first to suffer and die and come a second time to rule and reign. Turn with me to Matthew chapter 1, verse 18. We get our answer here to the question, why did Jesus come? What was the purpose of the ministry of the Messiah in his very first appearance? Matthew chapter 1, verse 18. Of course, the story is about Mary and Joseph. Mary and Joseph were engaged to be married, but they did not come together sexually yet. And Mary had been told by an angel that she was pregnant of the Holy Spirit. Imagine her predicament. 
Oh, Yvay, you know. Joseph, I have something to tell you. An angel told you, what? Yeah, right. And Joseph was a human being. He was a man like us. Imagine the shock. Imagine the, the discouragement, the despair, the, the doubts that must have come into his mind. And Joseph was wrestling with this issue. Here's my fiance pregnant. And she claims an angel told her that God did it. Oh, my goodness. And in Matthew chapter 1, verse 18, it says, Now the birth of Jesus Christ was as follows. After his mother Mary was betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Spirit. Then Joseph, her husband, being a just man and not wanting to make her a public example, was minded to put her away secretly. But while he thought about these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take to you Mary, your wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. And she will bring forth a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. You see, Jesus came the first time to save us from our sins. He came as a ransom for many. John the Baptist said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. In just a few days, Jesus, as he sat on that Mount of Olives on that donkey, knew that he was indeed going to be the Lamb of God. He would be arrested by the Pharisees, the Sadducees, tried in an illegal assembly in the middle of the night the next morning, taken before Pontius Pilate. And Pontius Pilate, typologically acting as the high priest who on Passover examines a lamb to see whether it's without spot and blemish, Pontius Pilate examines Jesus, who John the Baptist said was the Lamb of God. Pontius Pilate says, I find no fault in this man a lamb without spot and blemish. He was then crucified. Why? Isaiah tells us in Isaiah 53 that he poured out his soul unto death to make intercession for the transgressors, for the sinners. He came the first time to pay off the sin debt of all mankind. He didn't come to set up the kingdom. He didn't come to help the Jews with the Roman problem. He didn't come to help them with taxation without representation. He came to pay off the sin debt of all mankind. He came first as the suffering servant. Now, during the Day of Atonement, for hundreds and hundreds of years, the rabbis had a tradition. They would find a goat upon which they would tie around the goat's neck a red cloth. And this goat, rather than being sacrificed, would be led out into the communities, out into the, the hills of Jerusalem, out in the hills of, of Israel. And teams of scouts would follow this goat. And each year after a period of time, the red cloth would eventually turn white. And it was an indication to the rabbis at that time that the sins of the nation of Israel had been forgiven by God. Though your sins be as scarlet, they will be as white as snow. This sign, they felt, was a supernatural sign from God. The red wool turning white was an indication that God's, that the Levitical system of animal sacrifice was efficacious in covering, atoning for the sins of the people. Well, it was a very interesting statement in the Babylonian Talmud, in the tract Yoma, chapter 39b, that says 40 years before the second temple was destroyed, the red wool did not become white. Now, the second temple was destroyed in A.D. 70. And this statement is saying that about 40 years before the temple was destroyed, roughly A.D. 30, this supernatural sign that God had given to the Jews, the red wool turning white, indicating that the sins of the nation of Israel were being atoned for by the sacrificial, animal sacrificial system, was no longer functioning. No longer, for years and years and years, did the red wool turn white anymore. No longer was this supernatural sign that the Jews realized was God sending them a message that their sins had been forgiven because of animal sacrifice. It was no longer happening. And it's recorded for all of history that it no longer happened. Why? Because no more was the blood 
of bulls and goats and animals necessary for the covering of sins because the Lamb of God had come to suffer and die to pay the debt of sin of all mankind. And no longer was the Levitical system efficacious or even necessary because Jesus had come to take care of the sin problem, not to set up his kingdom. Hebrews chapter 1, verse 1 through 3, says, God, who at various times and in various ways spoke in times past to the fathers by the prophets, has in these last days spoken to us by his Son, whom he has appointed heir of all things, through whom he also made the world, the universe was created, who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person and upholding all things by the word of his power when he had, when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down at the right hand of majesty on high. Jesus took the cup. He went to the cross. He paid the highest price possible, giving up his life, the thing we humans value most, human life. He gave up his own life to pay off the debt of sin because it's a debt we could never pay off ourselves. You know, sin is a form of debt. When I sin against you, I'm indebted to you. When we sin against God, we're indebted to God. And the thing about a debt is there's only two ways to get out of debt. One way is to pay off a debt, and the other way is to have the debt be forgiven by the person that you owe it to. In effect, they pay it off for you. But the thing about your sin debt is it's a debt you could never pay off. You know why you could never pay off your sin debt? Because it's a debt you keep adding to every single day. Me too. And so this was a debt that could only have been paid off by someone who didn't have a debt problem, a sin debt problem, someone who had, if you will, sufficient equity. And the Old Testament says that God alone is without sin, and the New Testament in many places says that Jesus was without sin. It's one of the proofs of his deity. And so the creator of the universe became man, dwelt among us, lived a perfect life, and poured out his soul unto death to make intercession for the transgressors. Revelation 1, 7 says, Behold, he is coming with clouds, and every eye shall see him, even they who pierced him, and all the tribes of the earth will mourn because of him, even so, amen. You see, the second time he's coming in the clouds. First time on a donkey, second time on a cloud. <laughs> Zechariah 12, 10 through 12 says this, speaking about the end times. It says, and I will pour out, I will pour on the house of David and on the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and supplication. Then they will look on me whom they have pierced and they will mourn for him as one mourns for his only son and grieve for him as one grieves for a firstborn. This verse, written hundreds of years before Christ comes, speaks about the end times when the Messiah comes. It says that they will look upon me whom they have pierced. Who did the ancient Jews believe this was? In the Babylonian Talmud, tract Sukkah 52a, the ancient rabbis that wrote the Talmud said this, What is the cause of the mourning of Zechariah 12.10? It is well, according to him who explains, that the cause is the slaying of Messiah, the son of Joseph, since that well agrees with the scriptural verse, and they shall look upon me because they have thrust him through, and they shall mourn for him as one mourneth for his only son. The ancient Jews recognized that this portion of scripture, Zechariah 12.10, was speaking about the Messiah, that when he would come, that the Jews would recognize him whom they have pierced. Jesus came on that day, Palm Sunday, Right on time, 173,880 days after the command went forth, he came right on time. And he expected them to know it was time. Jesus was the only guy up there on a donkey. There weren't like seven or eight other people with their, you know, abacus there counting. Okay, 170, yeah, it was the right day, here I am. No, there was no competition. He was the only guy there on a donkey. And the crowd, some of the crowd, Rejoiced because they knew he was the Messiah. But it wasn't to be to set up the kingdom. It was to come as the suffering servant to die for the sins of mankind. Next time, he's coming in the clouds, folks, so keep looking up. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we praise you and thank you for your word. We thank you, Lord, 
that you've given us such an incredible prophetic warning about the truth of who you are, what you did, and that you were right on time, Lord. And Lord, we know in our lives, sometimes it seems like that you're not there, Lord. Where are you, Lord? How come you're not here, Lord? It seems like you're not on time, Lord. Lord, I need you now. But Lord, we know that you are on time as you were then. You came as that suffering servant, humble, riding on a donkey. And Lord, I pray for this church, that you would fill this church with your Holy Spirit. Empower these people to tell others, especially this Easter week, about the great prophecies that foretold your first coming and the prophecies that foretell your second coming. We ask you, Lord, to come quickly and help us, Lord, to be faithful servants, to love you and to serve you and to look up, Lord, for next time we know you're coming in the clouds. We thank you, Lord, for coming to pay off our debt of sin. That you came to pay off our debt of sin because it's a debt we could never pay off ourselves. We thank you for that, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.